right. Good to be in God's house this evening. I, <clears throat> I told Brother Jimmy that um, I was going to try to finish uh, this session tonight if I possibly could. And uh, if not, why well, we will make some arrangements. But I've already, uh, I've already determined that God's. Well, it's not what I was going to do next, but uh, I got interfered with. That, by the way, that's the meaning of "blessed art thou." You know, when the angel told Mary, "Blessed art thou among women," it means you're interfered with. And God certainly interfered with her life. Well, He interfered with me. Uh, while I was studying the other morning, and uh, and so what I was going to do, and I'm like, but God, you don't understand. I've, see, I've got all this already ready. I'm, you know, it's good to go. And it's like, no, going here. And so we will be, we will. Be, I'll just give you the title of it. The title we're going to be doing in our next uh, series is the battle within. The battle. You can't understand hillbilly. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm bilingual. I speak I speak I speak Appalachian Appalachian English and uh, and sometimes I try to do regular English, but I, sometimes I lose that. But anyway, uh, but it, no, it is. It's going to be a study on the whole thing about the flesh and the spirit, and every single Christian on earth struggles with that battle. Amen. Okay. Anybody says they don't have that problem, they lying, okay? And uh, lying ain't real good. <clears throat> now, you all know John 13, 34, and 35, okay? And I hope that you have gotten to a point where you can quote that from memory. Uh, those, are, those are just two great verses to put into your memory bank, and I know some of you, memory bank about overloaded already, and... Uh, some of us were like, y'all remember that Etch-A-Sketch toy they used to have? And you turn it up and you shake it and it clears it. Every time I shake my head, it does the same thing. It just Everything's gone, all right? But uh, we saw, uh, when we looked at the forgiveness parable last week, we saw that there was a terrible result for the unforgiving man in Matthew 18. Terrible, terrible result. Now, can we expect it to be any different for us? See, it's a principle. Principle. There, are, there are Bible principles, uh, and uh, and when you find a Bible principle, it means that if it's that here and here and here and here, it's going to be like that here. Okay, and uh, so that is a Bible principle. <clears throat> we also talked about forgiveness and prayer. Now, there's not much question on forgiveness in our prayers. If we don't forgive those who offend us, then God says he will not forgive us our offenses. And this has nothing to do with salvation now, but it has everything to do with the Bema judgment. Y'all know about the Bema judgment. Even Christians are going to stand. They're the ones that will be before the Bema judgment of Christ to give an account of the works done in this body, whether good or or bad, okay? We get forgiven, we get back in fellowship with God, but there's a day when the fiddler has to be paid. And uh, and so uh, I'm, I don't know all there is to know about that. Uh, you say, well, you mean we're going to be heartbroken? I don't think so. I, I think that we'll be in a, a whole different uh, set of circumstances when we get to where we're going, Amen. Now we come to the final objective of this session and the final objective of this whole series. How to forgive. How to forgive. Uh, and it's how to forgive biblically. Okay? Now, if you don't know what forgiveness is in the Bible and how it operates, then you don't know how to forgive biblically. And what we do, we need to do it according to God's Word. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, uh, that's one we've used several times, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Okay? Even as. Uh, the, the way we forgive others is the way 
God forgives us, okay? So just how does God forgive? That's the question. Uh, does God forgive everybody? Does God forgive everybody? Simple answer, no. If God forgave everybody, then everybody would go to heaven and Armstrong would be right. Okay. How many of y'all remember Herbert W.? Okay. And he teaches everybody's going to wind up in heaven one day after a while. Some of them will have to go through hell for a little longer than the others do, but they're all going to get there eventually. Okay, that's the reason he's considered a heretic. All right, now, God does forgive any and everyone who asks him to and follows the right prescription of believing that Jesus Christ raised from the dead and confessing that they are a sinner. God forgives, okay? God forgives us of our transgressions against him. Uh, after we are saved, <clears throat> we come and we get uh, forgiven, but we get forgiven when it's coupled with repentance. Do you know, the word repent, uh, an interesting word, especially in the Greek language, <clears throat> the word repent, is kind of like the uh, military term, about face. Now, we all know what about face. I, I know. Now, we get confused by these religious pictures. I mean, y'all seen some kind of a portrayal picture, sketch or something, of a road going along, and one fork goes this way and the other one goes that way. Have y'all seen things like that? Okay. Ain't what works. If, if you're on that road toward hell, which you are when you're born, okay, you're, you're started out in the right direction <clears throat> or in the wrong direction, and you're going along, in order to change where you're going to, you've got to turn around and go the other way. So the word repent means turn around. Turn around. If you're going up a ladder, you can't be going down it at the same time. Okay? Now, God holds back forgiveness. Now, I'm talking about, uh, here I'm talking about Christians, people who are saved. God holds back forgiveness in order to lead us in the right way to the right actions, including repentance and acceptance of His grace. God forgives us when we repent. And, and you know, uh, God will forgive us and put us right back in fellowship with him and so forth. <clears throat> now, I really love to teach using uh, visuals or analogies or things, or things we can understand. I learned that from one of the greatest teachers ever known to mankind. His name was Jesus. How many times did he say, uh, you know, John 15, love that one. I am the vine. You're, you know where there's that when he's telling them that? walking through those vineyards on their way up uh, to Gethsemane. There's the vines. He's telling them about the vines. So uh, I've got one I picked up. I don't know where. If I knew where, I'd give credit for it, but I don't. But anyway, little boy and his mommy prayed together every night, every night, about bedtime. And uh, on one occasion, you know, I always prayed together. Well, on one occasion, little boy asked his mom, said, Mom, can I pray privately tonight? Can I, can I pray by myself? Well, that stunned the mother, and uh, she, she wanted to, oh, why, why would you not want to uh, pray like we usually do together? And he said, well, see, Mom, I, I've done something wrong today, and it's been bothering me. And, and if, if, I, if I say it out loud, you'll just scold me, but if I tell God, he'll forgive me and forget it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? From the mouth of children, folks. Aren't you glad God does just that? God forgives us. Now, isn't it a shame that many do not take time to talk to him and ask him to? Uh, man, I tell you what, don't let those sins pile up. Take care of them as they happen. Okay? Uh, don't be like a person said, Lord, if I've done anything wrong today, please. Uh, if. If I have done anything wrong. Did you get up and breathe today? 
then I guarantee you, you know, you've got some things during the day you can take the Lord and get them taken care of. Now, God, we're talking about how God forgives us. He forgives us immediately when we ask Him. We ask immediate, just as soon as you repent and ask God to, He forgives. God does not hold you over a barrel. God don't want to watch you squirm. A lot of people today, Christians, uh, they'll get some forgiveness for the other person, but they still want to kind of make them squirm a little bit. Y'all getting real quiet now. Okay? Ah, God forgives completely. Holds no grudges. God holds no grudges. If he did, I'd be ruined. If he did, I'd just, I'd just go ahead and close this up and, 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 and go on about life and say, you know, hey, where I wind up, where I wind up. Because, you know, if, if God held grudges. So God uh, forgives immediately. He forgives completely. He doesn't hold any grudges. And he forgives forever of that offense. Forever of that offense. Now, you may do the same thing again. But you don't say, well, I took care of that way back yonder. And got... No, uh-uh. You do it again, you gotta, you got to come to God with it in repentance, and God, He will forgive you over and over. And You know why He'll do that? Because He said, if thy brother sin against thee seven times in one day and turn again and repent, then you forgive him. Okay? And He, he, he loves for us to come to Him repenting and depending on His grace and asking Him to. Immediately, completely, forever, and without stipulations. Hmm. You know what? Christians who have other folks, other Christians especially, who uh, offend them in one way, they forgive them, but they put them on probation. I don't want probation. Okay, I don't want probation and and God or God the Holy Spirit to be my probation officer. I don't I don't want probation because uh, I'm, I'll probably do it do it again. Somewhere along the line, I'll do it again, and uh, and so I don't need for see probation. If you violate your probation, you go back to jail. I don't want that. All right. So God forgives immediately, completely, forever, without stipulations. And God forgives on the basis of Christ's work on the cross. God forgives us on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. Nothing more, nothing less. Simple, very simple. You know, I love, uh, I love the Bible because even though you know, a lot of people complicates the Bible. And somebody says, well, now, this is, this is what it says, but this is what it means. If, if God don't mean what he says, then who knows what he means and who gets to say what? Okay? So, so God forgives on the basis of Jesus' work. Immediately, completely, forever, without stipulation, on the basis of the work of Christ, and he does it for Christ's sake. He does it for Christ. Uh, Romans 8, 29, that he, Jesus, may be the firstborn among many brethren. That Jesus may be the firstborn among many brethren. God forgives so that Jesus may be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus died to pay the debt. He shed his blood to pay the debt. He was the sacrifice to pay the debt. Now, God's forgiveness to us is in honor of the work that Jesus did on the cross. Not on our merit, not even though, uh, even though we did ask, but God's grace and, and God gave that to us to ask. God tells us to forgive one another in the same way. Uh-oh. Some of us run up on a stump right there. In the same way, not the same sort of way, not kind of the same way, but the same way. So 
What is that same way? Immediately. You forgive immediately, completely, forever, without stipulations, based on what Jesus did on the cross, and you do it for Jesus' sake. Now, when somebody offends you, let me tell you, look at it like this. When someone offends you, you ought to say, well, hallelujah, another opportunity to forgive like God forgave me. Wow, hey, huh? It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. A lot of times we look at things as problems when really they're opportunities. We have opportunities uh, uh, to be what God wants us to be. Now, keep, uh, keep the one most overlooked part of this in mind. God's forgiveness. I'm gonna, you know, I told you to raise some eyebrows. Well, get ready. God, God's forgiveness is already available. God's forgiveness is available. Here, it, It's there. It's there. It's like, it's like you sit down in a restaurant and the food is put on the plate. The plate's put in front of you. And it's there. It's in front of you. It's yours for that. And you don't even eat it. Now, that's not me. I'd, I'd take care of it. Don't worry about it. Okay? But, but if, if God's forgiveness is there, it's already available. You don't have to go and repent to God and then God have to drum up some, some forgiveness. Now, hang on to that thought. But it is just, God's forgiveness is dispensed only to those who repent and ask for forgiveness of sin. Now, he forgives those who repent and ask him to. Forgiveness already there. Yours for the asking. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Is everybody going to be saved? No, just the whosoever wills. All right? Now, I want to give you, they always tell you in uh, any, time, any kind of courses on preaching or no matter what, part of it it is, they always say, don't ever use personal illustrations. Well, I don't know why not. I ain't got nothing. My testimony can't consist of anything else but me. My experience, my thing. <clears throat> I had one time, a long time ago, there were some brothers, and they were in business. I'll be real careful to keep this generic because uh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to offend anyone uh, of them. I love them dearly. In fact, one of them, I pray for him every single day, and I've not laid eyes on him in 35 or 40 years. But they built up a, a pretty sizable debt and uh, came up and they couldn't pay the debt. And uh, I found out what the circumstances was, and it really was not all of them's fault. And uh, so after a while, when I realized what had happened and what kind of a situation that the two of these brothers were in, uh, there was three of them to start with, but what situation two of them was in, one, one day in the office, I just I pulled out their file and I took all of their orders and all of their invoices and I put them in the shredder. And I just kept shredding until they were all gone. Kept shredding until they were all gone. Now, I forgave them, right? I didn't call them up and tell them that. It cost me a good sum, but it didn't cost me as much as holding a grudge against two Christian brothers. Okay? I turned them over to God. Forgiveness, my part, was done and over. I done done my thing. You see? They did not come to me. They did not call me. There was no correspondence from them to me. And so all the while, though, God was at work. Well, one day, about <clears throat> up in kind of mid to late afternoon, I got a telephone call. Spur of the moment thing. Uh, called and said, brother, brother, brother Carter, could you possibly come over to a certain church and, and preach for us this evening? He said, the preacher we had scheduled uh, is sick and can't make it, and, and we'd like for you to come preach. I thought, oh, Lord. 
But I went. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. I got the time of the service, and I'd preached there before. And, and uh, God was working, and God's timing was right. Now, see, we got to be careful because God's timing is important, you know. And when you read uh, what Romans 8, 29, isn't it, that likewise the Spirit also uh, helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us according, you know, and and uh, with uh, made, um, for groanings that cannot be uttered. So God's timing was right. God arranged every bit of this. And since it was only a couple hours, three prior to the service, I'm sure uh, these two brothers had no way. Oh, by the way, at least one of these brothers, maybe two of them were deacons in the church where I was going to preach that Sunday night. A little bit of a strain on me, I'll be honest. And, and when I went in... Uh, if a ghost had appeared, okay, very awkward, especially for them. There was stuttering and stammering. There was tears. There was remorse. There was true repentance. Other folks around had no clue what was going down. They didn't have a clue what was going on. You see, and then I told them, your account is at zero. That was worth every penny it cost me. That was worth every bit it cost me. And, and I said, you know, you've forgiven already. Yet they had lived under the tormentors for all that period of time for months. Months. They cried. They talked about how they wanted to call me and, and how they wanted to tell me and how they want. And, and I said, well... Time wouldn't write. God, see, see how God used, I had already forgiven them long time back. Long time back. Don't forget about it. But on that time when we came to face, and then their remorse poured out, their repentance poured out, and, and they asked me, and I said, yeah, sure, no problem. You're already forgiven. Your account's at zero. Everything's been shredded. You're good to go. Talk about getting out of jail? Huh? And, and they had been, I'm sure they had been tormented over that for a long time to have a debt that they could not pay. And you and I, when we sin, we've got a debt that we can't pay. And we've got to go to the Father, and He takes care of that. Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Well, I'm getting tired. I'm not putting up the... Oh, yeah. You put up with that person just as long as God puts up with you. And I tell you what, I guarantee you, God putting up with you, man, listen, you putting up with that other person wouldn't even hold a light to what God's doing for you. Amen? Now, I'm going to talk about the conclusions of this, uh, this session on the art of forgiveness. Keep in mind now, forgiveness is already there. Forgiveness is already there. But how many times have you seen it? And I saw it once last night on a television program. Uh, a, a man had, had killed a great number of this family and, and so forth and so on, and the man stood up in court uh, you know, had an opportunity to address him and said, I forgive you. And I, I looked at Judy and I said, I didn't hear him ask for it. Now, when you do that, see, it makes you feel good and you think it makes you look good. Well, I forgive so-and-so, you know, and they've not even asked you. You're, you're hindering God's work is what you're doing. Now, you forgive them in your heart, but the dispensing comes when the repentance comes. Amen? God has gone to a great length to make it clear that forgiving one another is an intricate part of our Christian experience. It's, it's very important. 
that, that's why forgiving others is very often a painful thing. I think Jesus on the cross suffered some pain. I don't know if I've mentioned to y'all, but I, I did a study one time and they even had help from a, a cardiologist and uh, another doctor, a general practitioner, and I had help from them. And, uh, and I did a study on, on they call it uh, our, our post-mortem of the death of Christ. What happened to him? What, what actually took place? And, and how did it affect the body? And I'll tell you what it would... How many of y'all saw the passion of Christ? Don't even come close. Don't even come close. Okay? Don't even come close. And, and the, the shame and, and so forth. You know, when people were crucified, they were crucified stark naked. How many of y'all knew that? They, when they crucified them, put them on the cross, that was part of the shame, stark naked. Just like the day they came into the world. And, uh, and so the shame and then the pain was beyond, almost beyond explanation. Now God has told us how to forgive one another. He didn't say it was easy and he didn't say it was a light thing to do. It's so much easier to just say, I forgive and then go on about your business. See? But God's work of bringing repentance to the surface may very well be thwarted by a superficial tossing around of the word forgive. Mm, think about that for a while. But he's told us that if we refuse to forgive one another, then he will refuse to forgive us. Once again, not talking about salvation, talking about when we sin and we come, oh God, please forgive me, but you didn't forgive this one, this one, this one, this one. And God says very clearly in his word, you don't forgive them, I don't forgive you. And you go along with that guilt and you're wondering what's wrong. I got all this guilt and, and I pray and I ask God to forgive me, but it seems like I still got this guilt. Well, maybe you better check up on who you have not forgiven. And you forgive them in your heart, okay? <clears throat> now, God does that. And, and it's useless for a Christian to pray, Father, forgive my sins if you're not being forgiving toward others. Maybe the repenting and asking has not yet come, but your part's done. I don't forgive people after they come and ask me to. I can always, I can always tell them, I appreciate that, and it's already done. The forgiveness happened very shortly after the offense. Isn't it great to know that on your part, it's finished, it's done, it's taken care of. Ready to be served up when they come to the table. <clears throat> now, we absolutely, positively must practice the art of forgiveness. To fail in this places us in a horrible prison. <clears throat> and it's a prison under the full control of the one we've chosen to not forgive. They're the warden. <coughs> Excuse me. And every time they, every time they come to your thought, or every time they cross your path, or whatever, uh, they're going on with their life, and you're just, you're just straining inside because you can't get back at them. Forgive them and go on. Life will be a lot lighter. Based on the pattern of God loving us, loving others is to be unconditional. Loving others is to be unconditional. I don't care what tone of skin. I don't even like to say color. I don't believe in race unless it's NASCAR. Okay? Uh, and, and, and the whole word race is a problem in our world today. Amen? And yet we say, well, the, the, we belong to the human race. We ain't racing. We ain't racing. The whole idea of racing is somebody getting ahead of somebody else. Amen or not? How about the whole human family instead of the human race? Okay? And, and, and we need to keep that. Now, based on the pattern of God forgiving us, the dispensing of forgiveness to others may be conditional. 
you dispense the forgiveness publicly or to that person when they repent. God is working in their heart like he is yours. You've already forgiven them, but they're still dealing with it and don't know it, and God is working them to come to repentance. The same way God does with unsaved people. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit draws them, and when they repent and believe, God will forgive them. Fine line between loving others and forgiving others. Private forgiveness is not the same as holding a grudge or feeling that the offending party owes you an apology. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Well, they owe me an apology. Well, aren't you something? You know, nobody owes you an apology. Nobody knows you an explanation. All they owe you is to say, I repent, and, and I'm sorry for that. And then you can tell them, hey, taken care of a long time ago, but I love you anyhow. Amen? Isn't that great? Even while delaying to inform them of forgiveness, you love them. It ensures that we look to do them no harm in any way. In fact, we look for ways to do them good anonymously. Now, there ain't very many people likes to do good anonymously. Ain't no feathers in your cap for that. Well, at least not in the cap that people see but there's one that sees all. You know, I'd rather have a high five from God is to have a high five from everybody in Sumter County. Amen? The premature extension of forgiveness may very well, watch this, may very well rob the offending person of the opportunity to repent and be right with you and be right with God, which is really what's important. It's not important people be right with me. It's not important people be uh, uh, think that they've made score with me. It's not important. It's not important. To be right with me or you is not primarily what God desires. God wants that offending person to come to the place they realize their offense and they're willing and ready to repent of it to the individual they harmed. Amen? And if God's working them toward that, let God's work, let God, let the Holy Spirit have His perfect work in their heart. You forgive them in your heart, you forget it, you're good to go, everything's okay, you harbor no feeling, and listen, pray for them every day. Pray for them every day. And don't put it in a form of a prayer request in church where you can tell everybody what awful things they've done. Most gossip is in the form of a, a prayer request. All right? Not good. But, but let, God's, let God's Holy Spirit have its perfect work. Now, you're not to wish them evil. Hard, 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 okay? You're not to work against them. Mm, yeah, but man, if I could just... Mm. You're not to seek to damage their reputation. I was so very careful on those fellas because I knew that, that they were deacons in the church and to, to take those two men and hurt their reputation for something that they absolutely, positively could not help. Okay? No benefit in that. No benefit in that. Okay? In fact, just the opposite. Pray for your enemy. The word covers adversary of any sort. Your enemy is an adversary of any sort. Cry out to God for their restoration to him. That is what is important. You are required to forgive instantly. You are not always required to announce it to the individual that you have done that until God works in their heart, does what he needs to do in them, and they come to repentance. See, Jesus said, if a brother offends you and seven times he turns and repents, you forgive him. Don't, don't lose the repenting part. It's so important, so important. Now, Genesis 40, I've got two or three minutes. I might, if, if somebody wants to leave, Ron Dodd at 7.30, just be real still and go on. Uh, but I'm going to finish this here. We just like a little bit. 
Genesis 42 through 45. Genesis chapter 42, 43, 44, 45. You know, you'll know the story. You'll know the story. A wonderful scene of person-to-person -person forgiveness, all based on the repentant attitude of the offenders. You remember Joseph and his brothers? Now, if anybody ever had a had what you would call they had a real good basis for really holding it against their brothers, okay? After a time of assessment by Joseph when the brothers came, uh, those deceitful brothers, they came, and now they're before Joseph who they sold as a slave, and he is the head honcho of Egypt, the ruling power of the world at that time. Wow! So after a time of assessment by Joseph concerning his brothers and the guilt and the long-carried remorse for their sins all those years earlier, and that they were remorseful, Joseph released his brothers from any supposed due debt toward him. There's so many facets to this uh, extended account through those chapters, but one often overlooked part is this. The brothers of Joseph had put themselves in an emotional prison. Their actions against their younger brother Joseph had haunted them. Every time they saw their father and every time they, they remembered when they brought that coat and put it in front of him and the father wailed and wept over his son and thinking he was dead all that time, and here they're given into the hand of the tormentors, which so uh, through their in, through their life, no matter what they did, they had to be constantly coming up and thinking about Joseph. Wonder what ever happened to Joseph? Why did we ever do that to Joseph? Okay, their lie was concealed from others, but not from themselves and not from God. They're living with their lie, and never did they dream that they would ever see Joseph again. Unknowingly to them, one day they did. Joseph saw and read the pain and the suffering in their faces. And he heard the words that they spoke in their own language. Because when he spoke to them, he spoke through an, I call him an interrupter, but an interpreter. Okay? And, and as he heard them talking, and they said one to another in Genesis chapter 42, starting in verse 21, they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother. We are verily guilty concerning, in that we saw the anguish of his soul. When he besought us and we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. We done wrong, and now this distress we have is there. And Reuben answered and said, verse 22, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. You remember some of the things Joseph told them. You know, y'all meant it for evil. God turned it to good. God sent me down here to, to preserve a posterity of our family. This, this is God's chosen seed line. God's chosen seed line. Jacob and his sons. That's, what, that's God's people, Israel. But Joseph did hear. And Joseph did understand. And Joseph knew they were remorseful. And maybe, just maybe, Joseph realized that God had been working repentance in their heart. Whatever the case, here they are in the very presence of the one that, had so very, that they had so very much offended, sold him to be a slave. And then, chapter 45, verses 1 and 2, then Joseph could not refrain himself. I mean, man, he just... You know, he's pretty gruff and gruff with them several times, but he finally gets to the point when he hears their remorseful statements and he hears their repentance and he reads the pain in their faces for what they'd done. Joseph couldn't, he just couldn't contain himself. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And all the Egyptians went out and there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known 
to his brethren. Mm. And he wept aloud. Watch those words. He wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. How big you suppose the house of Pharaoh? And how many people were involved? Everybody heard it. But if you look at that wept aloud, it's one of the most difficult translations in the Old Testament. Ten times that is translated thunder. He wept aloud. And ten times the word that they use for wept aloud is translated thunder. When mercy was accomplished and grace finally broke through, the sound of Joseph's grief and his love echoed through the palace. And what was the thunderous wailing that penetrated all of those corridors and all of those chambers? It was the sound of a man forgiving. The sound of a man forgiving. And it's described as thunder. Man, some of Somebody will just have a spell. Amen? Yeah. What I have presented to you is meat. It's not just meat. It's tough meat. It's meat that's been cut the wrong way. If you ever get meat cut the wrong way, uh -uh, you can't eat it. You can't, you can't tenderize it with a bulldozer. It's, it's hard to digest. It's hard to do anything with. But I pray you give it your most earnest study and see if what I have shared with you is not directly from the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, Almighty God, I plead, God, the spotless, precious blood of the risen Christ, your Son, Jesus. And, and Father, I call upon you that you would, uh, sh would allow the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit the everlasting light of your glory upon the small portion of information that we've been privileged to share with these, your children. God, a lot's been heard by them, some which is new to their ears, some that's difficult to hear, to chew, to swallow, to digest. And yet the more difficult, Father, is that which is opposed to previous information that might now be reevaluated in the light of your precious word. I know from my own experience that you will show the truths to hearts that are submitted and truly seeking. And I challenge now, God, each one here and on live stream that have heard these many things that we've taught over these weeks that you will now do what is your inevitable, either accept the light from God or reject it. He who knows to do good and do it not to him it's sin. Father, we've been so privileged to be able to share these truths. Thank you, God, for this church. Thank you for Pastor Jimmy. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. And thank you for hearts that are wanting to hear your word and learn your way and give praise, honor, and glory to you forever and ever through all things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And for these things, we thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.